Space between. Why, hello. This is the Space Between Podcast, a special episode of it, uh, where we talk about the space between life and art, passion and business, what's happening now, and what's happening next, and my new book, Destiny New York, Volume 3. We have, in the building, or colloquially, in this motherfucker, <laughs> her name is Shannon Lee. Hi, you guys. I'm back. Indeed. Yeah, check the first dun, 20 episodes or so, dun, right? Dun, dun, dun. Oh, dun, dun. I'm back. Oh. oh, or something. Go in. <laughs> uh, Shannon, uh, well, when we first started this thing, uh, the Space Between podcast, we were doing it with uh, myself, my wife, Amy, who is currently in Dreamland. Snoozing. Snoozing, snoozing, snoozing. And snoozing. snoozing. She'll, <laughs> she'll be back for next episode, which uh, will come out sometime this week, actually. We're doing two this week. Um, and we used to do it also with Ryan Fassett, who's the co-writer of Modern Dread, and Shannon Lee, who is the editor. But you know what? Shannon is back here to talk about the book that we just put out. Um, we promised on the Kickstarter for Destiny New York Volume 3 to do an audio commentary. We've done this before for Prison Witch and Afterglow, mm-hmm. and now we are here to do that. Now, I know that some of you who listen to this podcast have probably not read the book, and I just have to say... Uh, you are my enemy, okay? <laughs> um, no, if you are not familiar with Destiny New York, uh, I'd say volume one is a great place to start. So pause this podcast right now, okay? Go on Amazon.com and search Destiny New York. You'll find volumes one and two available. Catch up, and then volume three drops there um, in three weeks from now, and then you'll be able to read the whole thing. And then once you're all caught up, pop in this commentary, kick back, Put on, put on some um, uh, lo-fi hip-hop beats in the background, okay? Um, and just chill and listen to um, the sounds of my smooth ASMR voice, okay? <laughs> As you uh, listen to the commentary for Destiny New York 3. Um, now, uh, Shannon, you were a bit concerned, right, that we did not do commentaries for Volume 1 and 2. Yeah, it feels like a little weird coming in right. in Volume 3, just like off the jump, but... Yeah. Uh, you know, the people the people want to hear what we have to say. It's true. And, well, we can, like, harken back to Volume 1 and 2. So what I'll say is this. If you um, are looking for a bit on what on our thoughts on Volumes 1 or 2, you know, um, hit us up and say, we want commentaries for those two. Yeah. If yeah. you guys want that, like, we could definitely do it. Yeah. Um, but right now, this was promised in the Kickstarter. Um, so we're just going to do volume three, yes. uh, especially because this one is formatted different than the first two. So it I sure feel is. like it needs actually a little bit of explanation. It's uh, separated into two parts, kind of like a play would be. Right. Uh, the first half is from Logan's uh, point of view. Oh, no, actually Lilith. The first half is Lilith's point of view and the second half is Logan's yes. point of view. And actually, when you say like, like a play... That is so true to the point where we almost did it too much. Do you remember um, when we first started, uh, we have Act 1 and 2, and then we have a bonus chapter of the short stories. Yeah. At first, that was going to be in the middle, and I was going to call it intermission. Oh, yeah. 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 And it was just... Then we were, we were like, we're getting a little out of hand. Right. <laughs> because I realized, um, uh, while I do come from theater... I was a playwright before I was a comics writer, and while this does um, have, uh, it takes inspiration from the structure of theater, I realized uh, in talking to some people, some people, and I don't know why, because our short stories do have important plot bits, but some of our readers uh, will just read the main story, and they'll get to the short stories when they get to them. They see them as actual bonus stories. And, you know, they are bonus in that um, you guys earn them through the stretch goals on, on a Kickstarter. But we do like to put very um, 
plot pushing elements in there, you know? For sure. Some of the, the back uh, short stories lead up to things that could happen in the next volume. Absolutely. Or they'll explain something that was a gap in the main story will finally yep. get resolved in a short story. Yeah. yeah I, I love the shorts. Yeah. And uh, l- let's tackle these covers. Um, we have uh, three covers this time. We have our uh, main one, our Kickstarter variant, and our Rosie Champion variant. Um, the main cover is by Manuel Pretano. Um, oh, I, I should say too, uh, if you notice, we've had um, uh, three different artists throughout the history of Destiny New York. Four, actually. Four. four. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, volume four. Uh, with this one, we wanted to uh, bring in two artists. One, Eliza Romboli, and two, Corolla Barelli. Corolla is telling almost a spin-off story here. Um, while Eliza continues on to volume four. And she, uh, Eliza is essentially like taking on the New York version of the story. Yeah. So it makes sense that, that, that she continues to volume four. Yeah, we looked yeah. for having that fourth artist in Corolla because uh, she was doing Logan's Half, and Logan's Half is totally different because she's in California. Right. So that doesn't have that New York vibe, and we wanted a whole different type of art for it, something yes. smoother, uh, sleeker, and Corolla brought that, uh, where Eliza has um, a little bit more of a hectic, chaotic vibe to her art. She could do a lot more, um, I don't know, a lot more blacks in there. So it yeah. had this New York vibe to it, but Corolla's is, oh, I love this like nice like uh, grayish palette that sometimes she has. It just felt more chill, and that was yeah. the the California vibe that we were looking for. Definitely, yeah. Corolla's style is like, it's a bit looser and more laid back, while Eliza's is, um, there's an amount of hyper detail in there where it does feel the, the panels are packed with life and action like New York, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, it needed to be busy. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, in fact, I actually... Uh, do you remember when I asked you, I was like, do we split this into two volumes? Like, do, do we have volume three be the first half of Lilith and volume four be Logan's half? Yeah. I wondered that, but hey, I was like, you know what? Let's just go big and epic, you know? Yeah, let's just go for it. Yeah, so though with uh, the covers, we um, decided to have one cover for each of the main New York artists. So volume one... Had, was was drawn by Mamo, Mamo Pretano. So we always have him draw our main covers because he's the co-creator of the series. Yeah, uh, and he did the first full book. The right. Volume one, he did the interiors as well. Yeah. Um, and then volume two, the interiors were uh, Rosie. Yes, and she ended up doing our, uh, our variant, and we actually named it after her because she had a, a pretty big break at Marvel recently, and we just wanted to sort of... Uh, uh, give her credit as the legend that she is and call it the Rosie Champy variant. Um, but the cover A first, though, that's Mamo's cover, and mm-hmm. it, it, it essentially does cut the story in half, right? Yeah. It shows uh, Lilith and Trinity and Gia in this uh, New York decked out in green, mm-hmm. while Logan on the, on the lower half is very separate from them, and uh, she is in California, uh, which is bathed in gold, you know? Yeah, sitting on a beach. Indeed. And uh, then Rosie is cover C, and she drew volume two beautifully. Um, and she came back to do this cover that um, it focuses a bit more on Logan's story. Um, it has Logan in the bathtub with Taylor, who is her new girlfriend. She's a character that you'll meet in Act 2. Yeah, um, and the first time Taylor's being shown on a cover. Oh, Actually, yeah, absolutely. for, for yeah. even our, our Manuel cover... It's the first time they're supporting characters on the cover. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah that's true. The cover one and two both just had Logan and Lilith. Now yep. we, we have, um, you know, some more people showing face on covers, which is cool. That's fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's actually, too, um, e- even the back covers of volume one and two only had them. And, yeah. And then the back cover of volume three has Bailey, who was Logan's ex. Yeah, and Bailey, believe it or not, actually has... A significant role in this volume yeah. and sort of a farewell in a way too yeah so oh, definitely, yeah definitely. so we figured she'd be a great person to spotlight just absolutely because we might lose the chance <laughs> and um on the rosie's cover it, it shows um in a creative way 
that Logan is still in some way thinking of Lilith, even though they've been uh, separated by... Um, yeah, there's a little uh, reflection. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. And then uh, cover B, our Kickstarter variant, is by Eliza, who is the new uh, main series artist. She draws Act 1 of Volume 3, and then she is actually right now drawing Volume 4. Uh, she continues as the series artist. Uh, this one really taps into the theme of, uh, of this book. We have the two main characters, Logan and Lilith, in the front. And behind them essentially is a larger superimposed version of what's going on in their life. Uh, behind Lilith, you see her sister Song, who is comatose in this volume and is um, part of, if not the whole reason why she stayed behind in New York yeah. while Logan continued on to California. And then behind Logan, we see Taylor on the cover again. Yeah. Um, and here we actually get a better look at her eyes and we see that she's a seer. Um, so far... I um, like that they're back to back. They're almost making that split again between the two of them. Oh, exactly. And you see above them, the stars cluster in the middle, yeah. which creates a nice divide right between them. Yeah, it just explains that the book is divided and their relationship is divided and Very every much. everything. A lot of... Uh, Things are insinuated, and I love, I, I love Taylor's clothing style here too, with her shirt ro rolled up here. You know, <laughs> it's cool. Guy. Definitely. Um, all right, so you want to dive in? Yeah, we're gonna dive in. This is a lot to handle, so we're going to. Uh, we've had past books like Prison Witch or Afterglow that when we did commentary, we kind of went page by page. Right. This we're just doing chapter by chapter. Right. We're we're gonna maybe highlight some standout things in the chapter. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll just flip through. And um, if you guys have any questions about the book that aren't covered in this uh, podcast, hit us up. You know, we're, we're on Twitter at Space Between. We always want to hear from you. Um, I'll say here, Act One. This is our first time doing an act break at all because our books previously haven't had acts, they've just been yeah, chapters. Yeah. Um, so. And we were able to use that Eliza. Uh, image for right. the the act breaks. Yeah, because it was so hard at first to pick what we were gonna do for these. Yeah, and I just love the simplicity of it. You know, we have um, mm -hmm. one half kind of faded out. You yeah. know, to, to show who the focus is. It 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 quickly establishes what this act is about. Yeah, that's awesome. And then on the flip side of the act break, we have one quote, and it was so hard to figure out what to do here. At first, I was thinking like maybe we'll put lyrics, maybe we will have we'll, we'll commission an artist to draw something there, but we decided to just go for a quote from the actual act itself. Yeah. Um, so, act one is called Safe Passage, and uh, chapter one is called Summer One Without You. And just to focus on that, that summer one idea, we, we decided to have it clear that act one and two happen at the same time, so each act has four chapters, um, act one has summer one, act two has summer two to show you that it's the same summer being shown twice. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, we open up and we just get familiar with, with all our characters again, show little clips of what they're going through. Yeah, it just taps into each one really quick. Definitely. And then it ends uh, with a date that love. Oh, no, no. <laughs> the, the chapter itself doesn't, but like, we segue into a date. Yeah, we segue you know? into a date. Like, we, we get to see Lilith... Uh, full frontal shot here yeah. and it breaks the ice by saying that she's on this date right now yeah and it's her first time actually um it's her first time being a narrator at all in the book yeah yeah she, it's she's always been logan always been logan yeah mm -hmm. she had narration um a sort of poetic narration in a short story in the past mm -hmm. but as far as an actual in volume uh main story chapter this is her first time yeah um and, and would you say, I wonder if this is her first date since Logan? Or I wonder if she's gone on a few. You know what? Just getting into her headspace here. I, I left it open for the reader to decide. But personally, I'd say that she's been on multiple dates, you know? Yeah, but I don't yeah. think any of them are going well. No, no, no. Yeah, because no. you, yeah. you can see already when you clue into this one that this one's this one goes terrible. <laughs> it does. And but you feel like they probably all go pretty bad because it actually starts... With her, she's drunk, on, fell asleep on her couch, drunk, right. and she goes to this date, 
hung over still yeah still exactly yeah. so you're getting the vibe that these dates are probably wearing her out and she's probably just drinking and fucking around and like it's true yeah she's not having the best time i don't think she, she does have um she has an ease about the way that she speaks to girls oh you know? yeah she has a confidence yeah. and uh will give off the air that she's totally chill right now but yeah. she's meanwhile saying she's she's like i'm hung over right <laughs> and um what is worth noting too in the beginning here um I, I wanted to start the chapter with the idea that even though what, everything that she's going through she, she's confident she thinks that she did the right thing she thinks that logan is the one who messed up so we have this bit where um it starts with her saying i regret nothing and she's answering a question um mm. that her date has asked but the truth is that my idea there was to start with her saying that just to established that she isn't trying to give off the, the sense that she is just so regretful for what she's done. Yeah, because uh, volume two ended with with Logan deciding to go to California right. and Lilith deciding to say to New York, yes. stay in New York. So like you said, for that first line from her to say, I regret nothing, yeah. is like, yeah, she's happy with her decision. I mean, later we... On we start to see that she misses Logan very much. But yeah, she's oh, dude. Also, yeah, you know she's she's here because she has a mission in a way. Right, but then yeah, at the end of chapter one, we totally reverse that. Yeah, um, when she tries to call Logan again. And at the end, you just have a, a, a little box here that she says, "I regret it all." You know, yeah. We set up that I regret nothing just to reverse that in the end. Knock it right um, down. And the truth is that nothing, n nothing excessively magical happens this chapter. You know, you have her in, um, in in the mansion. You know, where Song is in a mystical coma. Um, but beyond that, we're really just planting seeds here. You know, she she visits the um, this portrait that that she took and she has a little flashback showing that she and Song have always kind of been at odds here. Yeah, they show clips of that. They show when she's on her date, she gets into a bit of a fight with Wally, which leads yeah. up to some stuff with her and Wally later on. Yes. Um, and then she goes to visit Trinity um, because she has to discuss some stuff with her. But uh, that's actually a super awkward scene. Oh, yeah. Um, she's visiting Trinity and so starts to come on to her a little bit. Right. She's feeling lonely. She's uh, reaching for whatever there is. <laughs> Trinity's adorable, but uh, they are just friends. And Trinity makes that known again here. Um Oh, and I mean, my favorite part probably of the whole volume to write as far as like humor mm -hmm. was uh, the interaction between Trinity and Lilith about Trinity's tattoos. Oh, yeah. This yeah. was a joke that came up literally just between it was, it, us. It was me and you, And yeah. then we were like, we should just write it in. Fuck it. Like, let's make the characters make fun of each other. Yep. It doesn't matter. And that's their relationship. So it made perfect sense for Lilith to be the one to be like, yo, why do you have the same tattoo? On both arms, yeah. And, yeah. and Trinity's like, no, they're they're a little bit different, though, you know. Yeah. And she's like, no, they look exactly the same. <laughs> like, <laughs> how did you feel when you first read the script and saw that she was making a move on Trinity? I was, I guess, a little taken back, but then it just made sense because of how this whole chapter went. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's it's just. Lilith is falling apart, honestly. And oh, yeah. uh, sometimes when you're falling apart, you just, yeah, like I said, reach for something in front of you. And that happened to be Trinity in that moment. Not saying she doesn't, she's not a, a good match in a way, but yeah. it just, that's not what was supposed to be. It's true. I mean, I'll say this. I entertained the idea quickly mm. of, um, of them being together. Not ever as a serious couple, but sexually. Yeah, yeah. And then I was just like, it's more of a, it, it's truer to Trinity that she never thought of Lilith that way because of how intimidated she is by her. Yeah. And you would think that Trinity, who is, I mean, in, in volume one, she's a gun-toting gangster who like almost kills Lilith on Song's order. Exactly. But the more you get to know her, the more you see that she she's just a, just a follower who do, who does things for money, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, volume oh, chapter 1 wraps up mm -hmm. with 
Lilith, uh, she has a conversation with Wally where we learn Wally's tragic history where he had a family and he lost them. And uh, he brings up a major uh, arc in this uh, act where he asks Lilith if she will uh, take his store. Because yeah. he, he wants to move, he wants to be done with New York, and he sees her as a daughter. And uh, as such, he wants to uh, sort of uh, pass the one thing that he has onto her. Yeah, which is Wally's bagel shop. Yeah. Um, and yeah, this is this is by far the most time that we've spent with Wally. Uh, we've had him in, in volume one. He was just a little one-off uh, gag, you know? Yeah. And then in volume two, he had a few conversations that showed his relationship with Lilith that 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 it was more than just uh, bagel man and customer, you know. Yeah, because I mean, Lilith is she's saying that she's visited this bagel shop her whole life, right. and it's it's just a a totem of New York to her. And she was young. I mean, she had family issues. I feel like it became a second home. Like she would yeah. escape there to do whatever she wanted, hang out and eat and everything. And you know, Wally who in his past story says that he has lost family members and and kids um him seeing lilith grow up and taking care of her when she was in the store and serving her i mean he felt maybe a little fatherly and it gets it gets even more into that but yeah for somebody at first reading that they could be like yeah this is a customer why is this such a close bond but under the circumstances and her weird family life and his weird family life it makes sense it sure does yeah i mean yeah i kind of um i never intended them to be this close but then in writing their scenes in volume two i realized that not only are they friends but they have this much deeper bond, you know? Yeah, that, you know... That life it, is more than It just way. made me think of Eleven and Hopper from Stranger Things. Oh, man. Because it, both, <laughs> That's both true. of them had, yeah, weird things that happened to yeah. them and that brought them together. You know, I'll say as an aside, uh, when Amy and I finished watching uh, season three this year, mm-hmm. um, when season two finished, you and I and Amy, we did a... Uh, sort of a podcast reaction to oh, that. Oh, that's right. That was fun. Yeah. Yeah, that was fun. I kind of missed doing that again this oh, time, you know? Oh, shit. We should have. Yeah, yeah oh, we should have. fuck. We should have. <laughs> um, All right, that was a side note. Yeah, back to it. We end <laughs> uh, chapter one. Um, Lilith tries to call Logan, and then we get the first shot of Logan all volume, which mm-hmm. is very different from volume one and two, because this has been very much her story. Uh, we cut to Logan in California, uh, where she is in bed with another woman, um, with a bunch of uh, pets behind them, uh, reptiles and fishes, mm-hmm. and um, she is ignoring the call or, or sleeping through the call. And um, it, this image um, is meant to harken back in a way um, that kind of uh, puts salt in the wound of, of our audience. You know, th- this uh, splash yes. is meant to uh, remind you of the first splash of Logan and Lilith at the end of exactly. Volume 1, Chapter 1. Yeah, yeah, where they they went on their date and then got hot and heavy yeah. right away. And, uh, yeah, we, we can see in this image of Logan, and we soon find out later that it's Taylor, but there's clothes uh, all around the room. Yeah. So, obviously, something happened. <laughs> and then we move to Chapter 2. Uh, now, I'll say this. I, I was very... Um, not uh, plot-wise, but structure-wise, this volume was influenced by uh, The Leftovers. Uh, I love that show, and I love how they play with structure in that once the characters were established, they didn't have that thing that TV kind of falls back on, where, and I love this about Buffy, uh, it was sort of a corner that Buffy painted itself into that they navigated beautifully. But I guess the deals that the actors had, uh, no matter what episode it was in Buffy, the main cast is in every episode, right? Yeah. In season two, when Angel's evil, there are one-off episodes where the plot isn't about Angel, but you just see him like 
like perfect example is Go Fish. It's the episode where the high schoolers are turning into fish men. <laughs> There's a scene where Angel goes to bite one, and he bites some drinks his blood, and then he spits it out. He, he thinks it's horrible and nasty, and that's it. Just to get him in there. Right, just yeah. to get him in there. So I noticed that I was kind of doing that. You know, like I would think... So how does Gia fall into this chapter? How does Anthony fall into this one? Yeah. And just I would think of ways to get our our cast, which is expanded so much into each chapter. Exactly. To keep everybody relevant is yeah. tough. It's so tough. So I was like, you know what? The, the leftovers will split the characters apart. It'll have one episode that just follows one character, one that follows another. And then I'll, it made me think, all right, so in Destiny New York, we have probably 10 major characters Mm -hmm. we don't need to see them every chapter no since everyone knows who they are now right um really the only person who the the only cast members who are in chapter one beyond that one um uh page that cuts to everyone is lilith trinity and wally and 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 augustine Mm. that's it yeah. We, we, we don't see Anthony, we don't see uh, Gia, we don't see Cherry, Joe, um, Meadow. So at this one, I decided to bring them in, but also keep the focus loose, you know? We yeah. start with Anthony, and then toward the end of the chapter, we um, get back to the main arc of what's happening with Lilith. Yeah, it's, it's nice to show what's going on in each person's life while simultaneously saying that it's it's all happening at once yeah uh, this is lilith's half of the book but it's also just new york's half of the book exactly so it's like since there are all those characters are there we are going to show what's up in their life at that moment definitely and um i also did um mean to harken back to volume one volume one starts uh chapter two starts with a flashback to anthony's past mm-hmm. and it starts with, with a flashback to his mother and this starts the exact same way. Yeah. And um, it then cuts to him at this funeral. And it, it establishes this visual of, of hands being held. It establishes uh, Anthony holding his, mom, his mom's hand in the past. Then in the present, these unseen hands being held. Um, and then it cuts to this funeral, uh, which I thought was going to... I mean, first, it, uh, it shows what Anthony's going through at this point. Uh, part in his life um, and I wanted to use it as a way um, to mend something old and start something new um, first we see how close Anthony has gotten to Augustine because something that I wanted to do uh, was have uh, have the characters grow between the volumes right um, in volume 2 uh, there's a scene where Anthony comes in to the coffee shop and he and a, a Augusta met in passing at in the end of volume one. Yeah. They met when they were brought into the mansion together. Yeah. As, uh, I guess you'd say, uh, they, they were kidnapped together, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, it's weird to say kidnapped, but, but yeah, they were abducted, I'll say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then in volume two, we see um, Anthony comes into the coffee shop and Augustine greets him as a friend and assumes that he's going to a party he wasn't invited to. Yeah. Here we have. Augustine and his husband Andre come to the funeral and bring Trinity, uh, showing that they're even closer to Anthony now than they were last year. Yeah, I mean, and the green bean is like a big stepping stone of that. Of Everyone goes there to get their drinks or see each other or hang out. And I would imagine that Anthony is stopping by the green bean you know, daily almost. And yeah. uh, he's seeing Augustine there. I'm sure that they've had conversations. And yeah, so it's not a surprise to see them show up at the funeral. Um, true. They, Like you said, they all experienced that same scary event together in volume one. So they have a connection in a way. And they yeah. all know Logan. And- they do. Oh, and also too, what, what I'll add here is that um, two, two things about this funeral. Uh, first... The flashback starts with Anthony listening to this song, and in the actual book, I wrote the lyrics to, to what it is, just, just a brand new song, but this happened to me in real life, where I was listening to this song by the rapper Nas, Okay. and it was called Dance, and it was about his mother who had died, mm-hmm. and as I was listening, my mom came in to me, 
and she she asked what I was listening to, and she saw that I was crying, and I played it for her, and at the end she was like, "Are you are you scared of me dying?" Aww. And I was like, "Yeah, I mean, of course, yeah. you know." Yeah. And th- this scene and this whole chapter is about that fear of death because this volume and I mean the, the series as a whole explores um, the unknown and just the fear that we're all gonna die. Yeah. And I wanted to do that, especially before we got to Act Two, which is very much about that. I wanted to introduce it early and see how a seer, someone who sees the future but not enough of it, would deal with death. Yeah, because you'd think that he would be more prepared. Right. But you, you can never be prepared for what's to come. Exactly. And I, I I do like that. Yeah, like the the second half of the book with Logan <clears throat> is gonna go all into loss and here we are in the first half and we're experiencing it here too yeah i like that and then we bring in uh the the spitfire here we, yeah we, we, <laughs> this is a fun part <laughs> yeah this is um bringing in meadow who last time she was this uh in volume two she was this beacon of positivity and excitement and now she has had this prophecy about her life that she thought it was going to be some cool fantasy thing, but her prophecy is that she is the last person to die of cancer and that she will die be- before she is... Um, I don't want to say before she's an adult, but she, the prophecy... The, the Sears had a vision of her dying before she looks much different than she looks now. She yeah, didn't look much older. It's not, yeah. It's in the near future. Right. <laughs> it, it's, not, it, it's not 10 years in the future. Yeah. It's like between five or so years in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So this is a awkward place to her, for her to even be right now. Exactly. I mean, she's being brought here with Gia because the two of them are very close uh, since Gia found her in Volume 2 crying in the bathroom and everything right. when she found out her prophecy. Um, but, yeah, to have a prophecy of basically dying and then you're at a funeral right now. So her her mood... Uh, oh, she wait, is wait. Her, Do you hear that? The cat. That... Uh, <laughs> this is I'm not sure if the podcast will care but I was just telling Shannon how my daughter Chi Chi our cat uh, she has a specific meow when she's asking me to come play with her toy that's the meow that's the for meow. the toy oh my god it's a, it's a very like throaty <laughs> bring meow bring me my you know? toy yeah uh, so uh, yeah no so so the, yeah I mean weird she, place for to be. She, she has her own personality here that's just true to her but she's acting out a bit because yeah. I think she feels very strange in this environment oh yeah um she doesn't want to be there eventually she's even taken outside yeah um and that that was also i mean i was talking about how that scene with trinity explaining her tattoos was was one of the funniest to write i but this too i love scenes that will pair characters who you would never expect to be paired right yeah and in this moment this is what she needed she so she acts out in the funeral she gets taken out uh by andre uh, Augustine's uh, husband? Yes. That's yes. right, they're married. Um, and his vibe was exactly what she needed. He yes. he is calm, collected, uh, a smart thinker, and she's just a kid, you know, right. and going through the motions right now. And he just has just a total kid conversation with her of being like, yes. do, you want, do you want a, like a coupon code to Andre's green bean discounts you know what i mean like it's just like he got down to her level and calmed her down and took her mind off of what was happening and instead now she's just like oh yeah that'd be really cool i can have that discount like you know it's just a kid's mind he he's very uh he is childish at heart you know yes he is that's one thing that um back to volume one we had a few scenes where augustine talked about him a lot before we met him and the idea was to set up the idea that that Andre w- wasn't a good husband. You know, we wanted that trick where we come home and realize, oh, no, 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 no. Augustine is just really big on finding the wrong in, in a situation. And Andre is very, 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 how can I say this? He is 100% at ease. 
Yeah, he yeah. is at ease with his home life, yeah. his job. He right now comes off very fatherly. Yeah. Like this guy is settled and yeah. wants to keep settling. Exactly. Like he wants to move forward and have this life. Yes. And yeah, what we've shown in the in the past like it was more like Augustine wasn't ready in a way. Right. Yeah, it was like uh, Augusta married very early. Yeah. And he still wants to go out at night. Yeah. And he wants to have an exciting life where Andre feels content just to live a happy life. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he definitely, uh, he, he finds it easy to speak to Meadow here. Definitely. And uh, then we have a scene that heals the relationship between Anthony and Gia. You know, they, they, they've been separate for a while. You know, they, they've had um, uh, some of Anthony's... Uh, visions had come between them you know exactly uh they the reason gia's prophecy gets fucked up she feels like is all anthony's fault right. which it isn't there's many people to blame right um even miss david's feels like at blame sure um but they both had tried to come together at other points but yeah. either a fight happened or someone doesn't show up or yes. this or that so here they are finally stuck together at the funeral and yeah. they have a heart to heart and we finally bring these two best friends together. Yeah, and, and that's why the, the chapter is called Fuck the Past because Gia, last volume, was so wrapped up in what had happened to her um, that it took it took something deeper. It took becoming... It took um, meeting Meadow. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When she had that smacked in her face, like uh, Meadow's life could end, yeah. but here I am... Just like holding on to a grudge that my prophecy got fucked up or something. Yeah. You know, she she's finally moving on. She definitely had a lot of built up tension. It's true. And I mean, when we first met Gia in volume one, she she was just coming back from a, a trip across countries looking for answers for her prophecy. Yeah. And now... She was very headstrong in figuring it out. I and mean, that's why the loss of, of the end goal there was so hard on her she feels yes. like she failed she fucked it up it's everyone's fault you know her life isn't over 100% because right. her prophecy is not done like she when right. it happens it happens yeah no you're 100 percent right because gia is she's very much the opposite of logan where logan uh solved her prophecy when she was 13 she wasn't a kid she was not really ready for it yeah you know? she wished that she didn't solve it that early exactly yeah but gia has spent her whole life preparing for it yeah so when she had a clear idea of what it was she was like all right this is what my life has been building toward but now for the first time we see a, a gia that isn't really focused on her prophecy at all yeah yeah, yeah. she's focused on just finding out who she is without it and it'll come to her when it comes to her. Exactly. And she's focused on g giving Meadow a friend, you know? Yeah. Um, and then she is called to the Aberdeen Mansion, where she gives advice to Lilith that leads Lilith uh, to a crossroads. Uh, the arc of Act One becomes clear here, where it becomes um, clear to the reader that the mansion is going to be seized by the MCEA, that's the Mystical Code Enforcement Agency, um, and that is where they keep Song. Uh, and the the choice here is for Lilith to take charge of the mansion and the company and really be Song's caretaker instead of just visiting her, or she can go to California and try to bridge the gap that she created between herself and Logan. Um, yeah, she discusses that she misses Logan with Gia. Right. Um... Yeah, and then we, when we jump back to the funeral, we have another uh, sort of unlikely pairing to show Anthony getting close to Trinity in this exactly, moment, yeah. who opens up a bit about her own mother, um, and we, we see, again, another softer side of Trinity. Yeah. Yeah, I think that very much in this volume, Trinity becomes almost the third main character, you know, she yeah. she's in every chapter. You know, she's very much, uh, she's wrapped up in the main uh, moving arc of the story here. Yeah, which is why we did a spinoff series with Trinity yeah. uh, called Gangster Ass Barista. Now when I was on. <laughs> it is. <laughs> but because, yeah, there's a lot more to her. She went from that uh, gangster lifestyle 
to just showing all the reasons that she's the person that she is. And yeah. we just... We can't get enough of explaining her side of stories also. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and then we have our first villain scene, you yeah. know? Um, and, and in fact, I'm not sure if you know this. This is uh, the first time, even though she's a very minor character, this is the first time that we see the on-screen death of a named character. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we see... Uh, uh, Senator Triner, who goes by the name Tracknar, we don't know why, and we, we don't reveal that yet th this volume at all. But he is the, the uh, focus of Joe Rowland's prophecy, mm -hmm. um, and we see him and his liaison Hassan Rathor. Uh, they have captured one of the motorcycle gangsters from Volume One. Um, this girl Savannah was in both volumes one and volume two. Yeah, you're right. And uh, yeah, she she was at, at the museum when Song was brought back. Yeah. And uh, she's captured. Um, she uh, at first resists, but once Tracknar uh, brands her with his symbol, this is the same symbol that we saw on the masks of the um, uh, Joe's would be assassins from volume two. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it's the mark of chaos, pretty much. Uh, he brands her with that, and she admits that uh, she witnessed um, Arvid bringing Song back to the mansion. Yeah, which is Truner's whole uh, idea here, is like trying to figure out if Song is alive or not. Right. So that's why this girl is down there in the cellar-like environment, uh, being tortured, trying to get that out of her. Right. Yeah, and then he just uh, he slams on... Uh, this platform that has the same symbol and what appears to be her essence just blasts out of her body and she's left dead. Um, and, and also notable here, Tragnar turns down uh, Hassan's offer to have L Lilith killed. Uh, the, the MCEA, who we find out here, we find out a few agents are compromised because she goes through uh, security mm -hmm. and an agent named Steve Graves calls us on to tell, tell him that she's there. Yeah, yeah. And Truner um, says, don't worry about her. She's not a concern, you know? He just totally brushes her off. Yeah, he's not threatened by Lilith. He He's just worried about Song coming back. Right. Um, yeah. I think it's notable, too, that he isn't someone who just kills when you can, you know? No, because he, he does have his position of power that yeah. he's, being, he's being smart with. He doesn't yeah. want to get fucked over <laughs> exactly. and have people figure him out and then here is um something that i wonder how readers feel when they read right mm -hmm. we end chapter two with lilith showing up at logan's and then we start chapter three about a month or so later and all we know is that it went bad yeah <laughs> that's it and this is a total buffy and angel moment because in Angel's series, Buffy makes one appearance. Oh, sure, sure, where sure. Yeah. <laughs> they get to be together. Right. And then it ends and it's over and it's a total one off. Like, but within. That's, the, that's a good comparison. Yeah, within wow. the series, they're going on at the same time on television. Yes. And I believe in Buffy's, they might say something about it. Like, and you saw Angel recently. Right. And then it's just, yeah, blown off. But. That's what I picture is happening here yeah. because we, we do. We see Lilith show up here and then we find out later on in Logan's half what actually happened. Exactly. Because I, I wanted that seed, one, to give the reader something to wonder for the whole book. Yeah, yeah. Until the end. Well, until closer to the end. And then I also wanted to, to definitely show more how these acts overlap because you could easily think that, oh, yeah, Logan's been in, in San Diego going through her life, and then it, it takes place after Act 1. This really contextualizes both halves of the story. You know? Yeah, yeah. When you end this and then pick it up in, in Act 2. Yeah. Um, so then, Chapter 3 is called Winter 1, If the Fates Allow. Um, and the truth is, I've always wanted to do a holiday special. You know? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if you get me on a series long enough... I'm doing a holiday special, you know? <laughs> Do it. Um, with Robin Hood, I, I was on there for 39 issues. I, I, I did a holiday special, you yeah. know? And then uh, with this, I was like, it's time. <laughs> uh, 
It's Com- just classic, you know? It's classic, and <laughs> I love the intersection of um, the joy and warmth of holiday with a bit of tragedy, you know? Yeah, totally. So, yeah, that the chapter before ends with Lilith uh, going to visit Logan, but now we're starting, that, like you said, those months later, and I just have this feeling that Lilith has been moping around for yes. all those months because it starts with her just having flashbacks of Logan and their happy times together during the holidays. Yeah, because th- this is definitely... This is the lowest that we've seen her. Yeah, yeah. And this is the chapter where, where she makes a major choice that will inform the end of this volume and feed into volume four for sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, so here we learn that the MCEA has a specific order they're looking for her to sign that will allow them access to the mansion. Which she cannot have that. She cannot have that because <laughs> Song will be arrested and she'll yeah. probably herself be arrested for harboring Song. Yeah. Uh, because to the MCEA, until Tracknar found out that song is alive. To them, they consider the song to be dead because she yeah. was taken into a different dimension. She's been there for a long time. Yeah, and they are not aware. And know? they still like they don't they don't know where she is. I mean, they figure she's in that house, but they're also wondering how because you know they don't know that she's comatose. So right. they're wondering how this person that could be up and walking around isn't becoming clear to the rest of the world. But exactly. she's meanwhile just laying in a bed. So that's how she's so easily hidden exactly and even though it becomes clear here now that she is not going to allow them access um when she goes to arvid arvid says you waited too long it's too late the the situation can't be helped there's a truck out there right now if we leave with her they'll stop us and see her yeah you waited too long they feel fucked exactly because now all eyes are on them and they can't transport a dead weight body practically So that's when um, a memory comes up in Lilith that she has a very vague memory of her childhood about a song having a secret door out. Mm -hmm. And that's just, we play that scene and and then we pay it off later, twice actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, And then I just had to do this little page of her throwing a snowball, you know? Um, (laughs) And her classic fuck you moment. Gotta do it. Gotta Mm -hmm. fucking do it. Um, and then also, for the first time in this chapter, we bring in a scene. It felt so long with, with, with like, in absence of them, you know? We have a scene with Joe Rollins, Cherry, and Mary Beth, you know? They were in every chapter last volume, mm-hmm. so I missed them in, in the first two, mm-hmm. but they just didn't fit in here, you know? So we finally brought them back. Um, and we have uh, an interaction that's that shows... Cherry and Joe are keeping up their secret affair. Um, and then Mary Beth figures that out herself, you know? Yeah, she finally tunes into what's going on, unfortunately. I mean, her she's heartbroken um, that her friends have been seeing each other behind her back, especially when she had a crush on Joe. Yeah. Um, and this, I mean, this is, uh, this is winter, and Joe and Cherry got together... In the beginning of summer, last last volume. Yeah, so, so they're it, keeping. It's this been a long secret. time. Yeah. yeah, for a while. Yeah, it's been a while. She, any friend could feel betrayed that they're not being told the truth. Definitely. Here. Yeah, and I mean the way that uh, Mary Beth puts it to, puts it together, it's sort of a uh, this last volume. Cherry almost told her, and the truth is, in my first outline, Cherry did tell her, and Mary Beth accepted it. Hmm. Which I, I think she would have. Yeah. But then in this, when Mary Beth finds out after sh- she gets a, a sort of weird dismissive comment from Cherry, and it has her upset, and then the more she thinks about it, the, the more she puts a few strange incidents together, and she realizes w- what happened. Yeah. Um, and I think it's that not telling that she sees as the real betrayal, you know? Oh, definitely, for sure. Uh, um, we we also have uh, Lilith coming home uh, for Thanksgiving. She ends up calling everybody because um, now she feels this disconnect. She 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 wasn't successful in going to visit Logan. Right. So now she tries to 
make friends and family here yeah. and she calls up everyone she knows all our supporting characters in a way and invites them over for thanksgiving dinner and we get to see her prepping and preparing this food and yeah. trying to be a host and it's crazy like as i'm looking through this chapter um so much it seemed of of character stuff happened in chapter one and two so many big payoffs in this chapter that seemed just to kind of breeze by because here not only do we have the mary bat reveal you know she knows knows what's going on we have anthony uh helps joe get a better picture of of what his prophecy is about and Anthony tells Joe that his his prophecy is about the, the senator. Yeah. So that's the first time, and plus, the very first time we've known that for a while, in a right. way. Yeah. But yeah, now he finally knows. Exactly. Yeah, we um, we revealed who Truner was to the reader in volume two, but now this is Joe who knows. Um, and we even see a flash of Joe and the senator meeting. Yeah. And uh. Yeah, we see uh, Truner welcoming students to somewhere. It, it looks as if it's his office. We see um, Joe cowering as the senator comes nearer to him. We see Joe drinking from a flask. And then we see the sun rising over uh, Truner's mansion. Um, and Joe's prophecy uh, includes the uh, phrase, warmed by the new sun rising. So that definitely ties into his prophecy. So we see a flash of him completing his prophecy, but we just don't know how it turns out. Yeah, we don't know what happens. So this was nice, yeah, getting to see Anthony jump back in to help with another prophecy. Uh, being nervous about that because of how he messed up with Gia. Right. Um, but here he is doing it again to try and help someone, which was brave of him, you Absolutely. know, to actually trust himself. Um and, and, yeah, there's a lot going on in this trap chapter. Yeah, we have Lilith. Um, she listens to Wally's advice about um, not dwelling on the past because the truth is the past, there is no really getting over a big loss. It becomes part of you. Yeah. So here she's like, okay, it's part of me now, but I'm not going to let, let it take me down. I'm going to move on. And I have two things that are mine in New York. One is the chance to have this bagel shop, you know? If I don't take it, it's gonna become nothing. And then two, which is her real reason for staying to begin with, is to save her sister. Um, and it is, hmm, it's not obvious, I don't think, why she wants to save her sister. They have a bond, but the bond has largely been one of tension and even hatred and violence. Um, but we show later in this volume, in, in one of the uh, uh, stories at the end, and I hesitate to, to, to say bonus stories because they are very essential, I'd say. You know, like they are, a, it is a full chapter, you know. In the first um, chapter nine short stories, you have a tale of Logan, no, not, not Logan, of Lilith and yeah, yeah, Song, Song. that. Uh, shows a moment of peace between them and it sort of a, it sort of a shows what Lilith wishes her sisterhood was you know yeah for sure that, uh, just to point out again yeah. in this chapter that Miss Davids um, has a conversation uh, oh my gosh why am I forgetting her name Henley yes, with Henley, Henley yeah. um, and holds up a note that says do not trust Truna or the MCA and it's on us to keep Joe Rollins safe. Yes. And just to plant that seed that they they will have a hand in, in trying to help or figure things out yeah. with the school or with the kids there. Um, they are concerned uh, professors and yeah, it's uh, true. teachers. Because yeah, Miss Davids is, um, she's headmaster, but she also, I think she feels, as you mentioned, she feels partly to blame for the incident with Gia in volume one. So I think that she takes these prophecies very seriously and she wants to help with this one in a more effective and more thought out way. Yeah. You know? 
Yeah, um, I mean, all, everyone's prophecies were linked, uh, were leaked, excuse me, yeah. leaked uh, online, and uh, that puts her whole school at risk and all the work that she's doing at risk, and yeah, she has a lot of care about what's going on. Definitely, and man, just um, now that you and I are working on Volume 4 right now, there's so much in this chapter that seems like it's something in passing that we're setting up for volume four. Oh, totally. Um, <laughs> because this volume, um, what it is, is there's an arc to what Lilith is doing and who she becomes, and that's the story. However, while that's going on, we're doing so much setup for volume four. Volume four is very much like the season finale, you know? Yeah. Yeah, there's always going to be those times in TV or sometimes even movies where there's the the setup, like you said. Yeah. Like, there always has to be a, a, a duller time where people are planning or plotting or things are coming together. Right. And then, of course, there's always a breaking point. But yeah, yeah we see Lilith go visit Trinity at the yes. end of this chapter. And for me, reading this, I was so pissed at Lilith because... Here she is trying to make this friend in Trinity, and then the moment I see here, I just think, wow, she's just using her, and right. she's just going to take advantage of Trinity and pull Trinity back into something dangerous when she's trying to live a, a safer life away from gangs and violence. Yeah. And, yeah, it, it made me have a bad taste in my mouth about uh, Lilith and her intentions. I mean, I will say this. I do... Um a major thought in this volume, and I mean, especially volume four, is uh, wondering how far to push that with Lilith. Yeah. Because... I think she has a good conscience that yeah. it ends up maybe stopping anything too crazy, but right. uh, that other selfish side shows yes. a bit. Yeah, th th there is uh, a bit of song in her, you know? Yeah. And there is... um. I think almost the fact that she, Lilith thinks that she's a good person. She she doesn't, um, she she kind of uh, feels that she is the break in the family. That that she is the good one. So yeah. I think that almost makes her a bit more blind to what she's doing sometimes. You know, she, I she's agree, yeah. able to sort of like say, "Oh well, I'm not as bad as yeah, my mom, dad, exactly. or, or sister." Exactly. But yeah, she still. Can have her own sides that De are definitely. shitty. And yeah, I've, um, just to give a bit of writer insight here into that uh, plotting for, for, for her character arc, I have thought a lot about uh, how far do we push her? You know, how, what lengths does she go to and how much does she blind herself um, to where she's still a sympathetic character? but one that you can definitely see some darkness in, too, because the truth is um, we found out in Volume 2 um, that she lied to Logan about why she came back to New York. Yeah. Um, she came back to New York because she found out that that song was um, collaborating with Senator Turner on something. And the truth was that she came there to mess that up, to... Um, uh, make it seem to Turner as if Song was uh, betraying him. And the truth was that Song and Turner were both betraying one another already. Yeah. And Lilith w just came in and sort of messed Song's plan up. And that's why Song was already angry in Volume 1. Mm -hmm. And why she... At first, Song thought that Lilith was working for Turner. Right? Yeah. And uh, L Lilith never exposed any of that to L Logan. Uh, to Logan, L L Lilith just missed New York. You know, she just yeah. came oh, out because she, she missed New York. Yeah, she kept it very vague. Yeah. Exactly. She's not going to, yeah, explain everything that was her intention. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, like you said, we, we jumped it off showing Song hating Lilith. Right. So much, and you're wondering why, but there is a lot more to that story. Yeah, there's much more to it. Yeah, which uh, until Song can maybe uh, express herself again, yeah. uh, that a lot of that won't be revealed or uh, resolved. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. only really now that we're seeing... Um, flashbacks what, and stuff. Yeah, we're yeah. seeing flashbacks, and we're seeing what Lilith does when Logan isn't around. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Um, so then, uh, 
let's wrap up this act. We have uh, the last chapter. Uh, chapter four is called Tower of Ash. And um, that shows Lilith uh, bring in a psychic to um, tap into a memory and sort of a mind meld with Song so she can better remember um, how Song got her out of the house that one time. Yeah, so then where she the can secret help door is. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and it all comes together in the, this chapter. It is the climax of this uh, arc, this act, um, where Lilith accepts Wally's uh, uh, ba- ba- uh, bagel shop. She says goodbye to him. You know, he leaves. Yeah. It's a you know, sad uh, departure for, for, for him. Um, but she is left, though, just to jump ahead a little bit, uh, to as we're talking about the bagel shop, the reason that I sent Wally off was one to uh, rob Lilith of a voice of reason Mm -hmm. and two to give her a place to when she does get song out of the mansion to have as her home base. Yeah. She needs somewhere else besides the mansion because the mansion is it's in trouble and it's, uh, it's not a good place to be. Right. Um, yeah, so she ends up, uh, getting a, um, a, what you would say she's a psychic yeah, type? Yeah. Uh, what was her name again? Priya. Priya. So yeah. when Priya first gets drawn, I immediately, like, messaged Pat and was like, love this character. Yeah, we yeah. need her forever. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully we see more of Priya in the future. Um, but yeah, this climax is insane i mean priya essentially gives song and lilith drugs in a way almost like a type of acid uh that they go into a trip together uh doesn't feel like it's together because song's just laying there but they end up in the same headspace yes and it's trippy and weird and the way uh eliza drew it was awesome and crazy it came out great i mean i think it is the most beautiful sequence that we have so far. Yeah, um, yeah. Especially, I mean, first, when we first introduced this mind meld, we have, uh, what I love is that we see things that we haven't seen yet, like we see Lilith young and old, um, and then we see flashes from stories that we do recognize. Uh, we see um, the conversation happens with them at different ages. Mm-hmm. We see a shot of them from a short story from volume two, mm-hmm. um, where, where they're kids. We see the scene from volume one where uh, Song is having Trinity choke her, mm-hmm. you know? And then finally we cut to their uh, shared mind space where um, uh, Song is wearing this dress of leaves from Lil's point of view. But from Song's point of view, Lilith is wearing the dress, right? Um, and to each other, the other person is naked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. revealed naked, you know, like stripped down. It, it it all has a lot of metaphors to it. And then we even see Lilith go from her age currently down and down to younger yes. to then her innocent young face that we've also been shown before in in scenes of of her vulnerability at her young age um looking up at song and asking like where is the secret door and we end this trip with uh song whispering the information into logan's ear but we still as the reader don't know what it is right yeah and i mean just this interaction between them is my favorite too you know i just Love how she drew the eyes here. Um, Song's eyes crying and Lilith's too. And yeah. I'll say this. You gave an amazing note that really helped here. Um, when you first read the script, you said to me, not only just of this scene, mm. but of the whole book. I believe chapter three, you said Lilith is crying too much. Yeah. Have her cry less so yeah. it matters more when she does. Yeah. And that really helped here. And yeah, it, it you, makes it yeah, very poignant. You're, you're totally right. Totally right. Um, and then we have um, the MCEA breaks into the house. They finally have uh, the order signed that they can seize the mansion. And as that's happening, Lilith is racing to the basement with Priya and Song as she now knows where this uh, hidden doorway is. 
And um, it Orvid is, is doing like a whole distraction here. Oh, he's trying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> trying. Uh, but yeah, it leads us to a, a basement room, a bunch of boxes. It's all the the mystical, magical stuff has been boxed up since the parents had passed. Right. And down here is a mirror that all of a sudden Priya and Lilith are picking Song up, and they just throw her through the mirror. Yep. And, um, yeah, uh, Lilith says that when she's pushing Song through, she tells Priya to think of bagels. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that later on uh, shows that the mirror sends you what you're thinking of, right? Yeah. So Lilith was thinking Wally's, and she just had Priya back her up with some, excuse me, I'm burping here, <laughs> with some bagel thoughts, you know? <laughs> um, and then we have... Our moment of tension, you know, because we had this chapter, I feel like has two climaxes, right? You have the MCA invasion of the mansion, and then you have Lilith Lil facing off finally with uh, Traknar. Uh, Traknar is a villain that we just mentioned in volume one. We brought him in in volume two, and then in volume three, he is now an active character, you mm -hmm. know? And we have um, this very tense showdown between the two of these characters. In, uh, in New York. And yeah, I love that this showdown takes place at Dead Horse Bay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's creepy, gross. It's the... It's just the metaphor, you know, of... of I don't know, just putting things at rest in a way. Like, like, like not, not a, anything at ease. I just mean the tension is being broke like Lilith is finally coming forward like I'm gonna be your problem yeah. not my sister like yes. leave us alone go fuck yourself like everything she's just like killing it like yeah. fuck this <laughs> yeah. and I think that this scene really helps with um the elevation of the threat too yeah uh, for, for two reasons um one uh volume two um, I wanted Arvid to seem like a more physical threat than Song was. And the, the climax showed that. And then I wanted to sort of uh, show in this scene that Arvid is outclassed. Because Traknar and Lilith are both more on level as far as like their, their knowledge of the situation, you know? Yeah. Um, my favorite interaction here that Eliza drew beautifully is... When uh, Lilith is saying, L leave us alone, leave the mansion, leave me, leave Arvid, leave. And Tritonar goes, your sister. And Arvid is trying to still keep it up. He says, Song is dead. And Tritonar just smiles. Yeah. And, and Lilith's like, yeah, leave her alone too. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's just tell the truth here. Yeah. Like, he knows. Exactly. Just leave her the fuck alone. I love that he even says here, you know, like, I've been so close to you that I could have just strangled and killed you yeah. because like he's known this family for years he's he he's sin, seen song and lilith when they were kids you yeah. know like he could have killed them then you yes. know but he let them grow up into women and you know he still is like you you're gonna be the threat he's like i could have killed you the other day when hassan just said like exactly. you want her dead yeah. he he he's surprised but also not surprised. This entices him. He he's getting off on this. Yeah, he's he, like, yeah this he, he's is quite so, excited. This is so awesome that she's also bad. Also, like too, she's yeah. gonna be an issue. Bring it on. Exactly. Like he's excited. Yeah, for he, sure. He definitely. I mean, to to put a pin on it, he loves the chaos. You know? Oh, he loves it. Yeah. That's why he is the chaos god. <laughs> yeah, he, he. I don't ever think that he's one that he's someone who is like thirsty to win. He's thirsty to see if he can win. Yeah, you know? and to see everything just explode all the time. Now, I want to ask you about something in this scene. What? Um, so, there's something that happens here that mm -hmm. plays one way here, and I'll just... I'll even talk a bit about the next volume, just because it's clear in here if you look close enough. So, <laughs> Lilith has this whole thing. She offers to have it be done, Yeah. right? And then when Trachnar turns her down, she snaps her. She has Arvid snap her finger, snap, snap his fingers, yeah. right? Now, seconds later, Trachnar gets the call, yes. right? That the mansion's on fire. Yes. So, he, here's something. 
to have the mansion have been on fire. She had to have had the mansion ordered to be set on fire before Tracknard turned her offer down. Yes. So, she never thought he was going to turn it down. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. 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 So, this whole scene plays differently once you know that. Right? Yeah, yeah. You... She went into this knowing what direction he was going to take. Yeah. And then, essentially, she had this conversation, not not to give him a way out, but to show him what she could do, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we see the, the mansion up in flames, and then Trinity walk by with a, a quip of got a light mate yeah. you know like we <laughs> we know she had something to do with it that she f- got the signal from arvid yeah and oh yeah and as she says that right you see her son look after her and register her mm-hmm. Trekner does not give a fuck no he no. doesn't care about he's who helps her yeah, yeah he's, by he's this. with this you know <laughs> Like he's he's happier than he would have been if he just got sung like the mansion. Oh yeah, yeah. this is like <laughs> a playground. The, yeah, the, the, then we have this uh, scene with uh, Cherry and Mary Beth. The, the, that kind of just underlines their separation here as friends, you know. Yeah. Uh, cause they could have um. Uh, just wrapped it up, but the truth is that. There were there's too much hurt here, and we're gonna end volume three and go into volume four with them not, not friends anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we end this chapter with another uh, sort of a uh, montage. It's of, not the full end. Oh no, it, th- there's a little epilogue here. Yeah, there's but a little bit more. As we're racing toward the yeah. end, though, we have that that final little uh, glance of what people people are doing here, you know. And it, this actually gives you hints about what's happening in, in volume four. We have. Arvid going to someone who has a bunch of weapons. You have uh, Tracknar on the news saying that he's launching an investigation into Destiny University. And then we pair Trinity and Lilith for this final scene. Yeah, in this final scene, we get Lilith to show that, yes, successfully, Song was sent through the mirror, yes. ended up at the bagel shop, and is now being kept in a dingy room upstairs um and she she's showing trinity trinity now knows you know um it's it's not a secret she has an insider yeah she has an insider who is telling her that she doesn't want to do any more gangster shit yeah and lil is pretty much like yeah 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 exactly (laughs) yeah 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 yo i have this secret thing happening right now um and uh, lilith ends her scene and this this act saying um, something about Joe Rollins. Yes. She, she does know about Joe. Um, there's been talk of things, you yeah. know. She knows that Anthony went to the school, probably. Everything's, you know, coming out. Yes. And she knows how to get to Tragnar. She does. And also, I'll say here, we see Trinity's Instagram name. And <laughs> by the time you read this, if you go and you add... Expresso Bean 666. That is X, the letter, Presso Bean 666. You can add Trinity on Instagram. Really? Really. <laughs> I didn't even know that. Yep. It, it's not yet for us. Yeah. But by the time that they hear this, it will be. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I had to hit you with that spicy, royalty free sound effect to break up the podcast. Uh, Pat Shand here. Shannon and I actually talked about this book for way longer than we thought. So uh, I made the executive call that this should be broken up into two episodes. It's easier for you to navigate. You know, if you want to tackle Act 1 one day, you know, you spend about an hour with us. Tackle Act 2 the next day. Spend that next hour. Ask him for two hours. You know, say say you want to get to a certain chapter. You got to skip through our voice hearing us go blip blip over and over again you know and now after doing this whole two-hour podcast i'm tired i assume you guys are tired after the one hour so let's break it up you know trust me i'm coming back to you you don't gotta wait a week we'll see you tomorrow it's already recorded it's already done just know for real though if you supported the book if you already got it i love you so much If you're thinking about buying the book, we're going to be on Amazon soon. 
Volumes 1 and 2 are on Amazon right now. Check that link below. Thank you so much. We're going to be um, uh, talking about Act 2 tomorrow. See you then. Space between.